Hi, gents. Can we run the stuff about the early years, please? The bit we did before. Thanks. You on the mark. October the 30th, 1938, actor-director Orson Welles' radio broadcast of War of the Worlds terrorises listeners who believe they are in the midst of a real Martian invasion. Another bullet, ladies and gentlemen. The latest word of the monsters from outer space. Uh, correction, from Mars. Sorry, folks, that's what experts are saying. The following day, aged just 23, Wells has to apologise to America for a hoax which has enraged the nation. We are deeply shocked and deeply regretful about the results of... Uh, Last night's broadcast. Hollywood, however, is impressed. His first film, Citizen Kane, although pronounced the greatest ever made, is a commercial flop, nearly killed off by press magnet William Randolph Hearst, who believes it is about him. Hollywood grows to loathe the maverick genius, and Wells finds his later films butchered by the studios. In 1947, at the age of only 32, his career is on the rocks. He heads to Europe searching for a new beginning and new opportunities. Thanks, guys. It's never quite as simple as that, is it? And with Orson Welles, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. But certainly, he did leave America in 1947 and with a heavy heart. <laughs> When Orson Welles stepped off the plane in 1947, it was hardly a new start, more like a return visit. As a young boy, he toured Europe with his father. This had inspired in him a deep love and knowledge of European art and culture. This time, Welles came to work, to direct, to be precise. He never settled in any one place for long. I'm never quite unpacked, he said. He lived in Paris, in London, in Rome, here in Ronda, in Andalusia, in southern Spain. And he spent time in Munich and in Berlin. He'd become, he said, a traveling player, engaged on an odyssey of his own making. Wells's stay in Europe spanned three decades, during which he never stopped working and moving. He's always been a hard man to pin down. Perhaps looking at his European work will help me to get closer to my elusive quarry. He's been very hard to catch so far. Mr. Wells, Orson! For 20 years now, man and boy, as his biographer, I've pursued him and he never ceases to astonish me. Whenever I think I've caught him or pinned him down, he vanishes in a puff of smoke. He's the great escapologist. After your old tricks, I see. Why not? I'm a charlatan. And a rogue. And a consummate master of illusion. And a victim. There were, it seems, a number of different Orson Wellses who arrived that year in Europe to bamboozle us. What I need to do is to find out what was it that he got in the old world that he couldn't get in the new. He got a signature tune, for one thing. Come out, come out, whoever you are. Step out in the light and let's have a look at it. Wells's entrance as Harry Lyme is one of the most memorable in all cinema. He plays a wartime racketeer peddling adulterated penicillin, but somehow makes the character irresistibly charming. Mind you, he nearly didn't get the part. The film's American producer David O. Selznick wanted Cary Grant, but British producer Alexander Corder and director Carol Reed absolutely insisted on Wells. But then they had to pursue him across Europe to get him to sign the contract. Wells seemed to relish the chase. Indeed, when Corder's brother Vincent arrived by boat one day, he found Wells waving at him from a boat travelling in the opposite direction. Why was he so evasive? 
Did he want more money? Was he thinking it was all just a game? Or did he really want to know that Corda and Reed wanted him and only him? Tell him I'll wait by that wheel, then. They did, rightly seeing something in Wells himself that perfectly matched the ambiguous character of Harry Lyme. Charming, dangerous, ultimately unreachable. Yes, I want to talk to you. It is his most brilliant and, in some odd way, his most personal performance. Have you ever seen any of your victims? You know, I never feel comfortable on these sort of things. Victims? Don't be melodramatic. Look down there. Would you really feel any pity if one of those dots stopped moving forever? If I offered you 20,000 pounds for every dot that stopped, would you really, old man, tell me to keep my money? Or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spin? Free of income tax, old man. Free of income tax. Wells dominates the film, despite being on screen no longer than 10 minutes. But with Wells the magician, even these precious minutes are often an illusion. You have to see his face to be sure it really is him. These shoes, not his. Nor these. Nor these fingers. They belong to the director, Carol Reed. But Wells was never simply an actor. His knack for coining an unforgettable phrase produced the famous cuckoo clock speech, its throwaway brilliance achieved after 32 painful takes, not the work of screenwriter Graham Greene at all, something conjured up by Wells himself. <laughs> Don't be so gloomy. After all, it's not that awful. Well, what the fella said, in Italy for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. So long, Holly. The part pole vaulted him into the public domain in a way that nothing he'd ever filmed before had ever done. That maddeningly catchy little tune followed him round the world. Wells eventually came to loathe it. But Harry Lyme brought him the one thing that he'd never quite had in America the public's love. Now he was a European star. His celebrity had moved onto another level entirely. The continent was his playground. So within two years of having taken up residence in Europe, Wells had established himself with what was essentially a glorified cameo role as one of the most famous faces and indeed voices of his time. There were lessons to be learned from this. Small roles could make big bucks, $100,000 in this case, and his fame gave him the leverage to make his own films on his own cherished subjects. the Moorish general, is destroyed by jealousy. Wells revered Shakespeare's work as one of the great monuments of civilization. All his working life, the dramatist was his greatest inspiration. This is honest Iago, awaiting a painful death. His crime? Betrayal. His cunning and deceit has cost the once noble Othello his new wife. Desdemona. Wells sometimes saw himself as a victim. Did he imagine some of his old colleagues back in Hollywood in this cage? I bet he did. He blacks up, to use that unfortunate phrase, to play the great soldier corrupted by his apparent friend, Iago. Strangle her in her bed. Even the bed she had contaminated. Good, good. The justice of it pleases. Othello was Wells' first European movie as director, but he had to produce it too, using his own cash. He hadn't planned it that way, it was just that the studio went bust on him. So filming was stop-start, depending on when he could raise money. This made things tricky, but crisis seemed to bring out the best in Wells. It was indicative of his effortless visual wizardry that he was able to seamlessly assemble single scenes shot months and even continents apart. 
So here, Rodrigo kicks Cassio in Morocco and gets punched back in Italy, a thousand miles away. In what would increasingly become his way of working, Wells the producer exploited his acting self, taking short, well-paid acting jobs in other films to raise cash for his own productions. If all else failed, he'd simply beg. On one occasion, after filming had ground to a halt yet again, he chartered a flight to Nice, where he found his old friend, the producer, Daryl F. Zanuck, at dinner. He prostrated himself, all six foot three of himself, in front of the Hollywood mogul. The result? A check for $100,000. Shooting on Othello was nearly complete, but now Wells had to cast around for money-making projects to subsidize the editing. In a spirit of careless adventure, he gathered up key members of his Othello cast and headed for the Paris Boulevard. Wells staged here at the Edouard Set Theatre in Paris a double bill, which he called The Blessed and the Damned. The first act, The Unthinking Lobster, his satire on Hollywood. The second, his version of Dr. Faustus, which he called Time Runs, with a score specially composed by no less than Duke Ellington. It was not, I'm afraid, a success, but it did introduce him to a dazzling newcomer. How would Wells not have been stunned by his ravishing young co-star? Eartha Kitt. Such was his enthusiasm that on one occasion he bit her mid-performance on the lip and drew blood. Orson Welles described you as the most exciting woman in the world, but what I want also to know is why Orson Welles bit you. <laughs> Come on now. Come on. The truth. At long last. <laughs> Probably because he thought I was the most exciting woman in the world. It's a very good answer. Wells later explained the bite away, saying that he was simply in the mood. Having got that out of his system, he went back to the Herculean task of editing a fellow. Then Laurence Olivier, a smiling rival of Orson's, both as actor and director of Shakespearean films, invited him to play Othello in London on stage. The grudgingly respectful reviews ensured it wasn't an entirely happy Christmas for Orson. He continued to edit Othello in London. He was learning to edit by himself, the better to control the film and his own destiny. Othello was the first movie since Citizen Kane over which he retained full artistic control. He could not have made it in America. In the last few years, you have been uh, making your base more or less in Europe. Uh, yes. Is there any particular reason for that? A great many of us have been in Europe during these last years because yeah. uh, it's been a kind of frontier for us in films. We moved west and now we're coming back again. It's a less organized, more anarchistic and freer atmosphere because it isn't organized on an industrial basis. For Wells, the term industrial was a pejorative reference to the Hollywood which had spurned him and which would have no reason to revise its opinion of a director who took literally years to finish his art film. In fact, his tenacity in completing the film at all on a shoestring and in chaotic circumstances was nothing short of a miracle, to say nothing of playing the fantastically challenging central role in addition. I hope you will not kill me. Peace and be still. It is too late. It would be four years before Wells completed Othello, doggedly editing it wherever and whenever he could, but it ended in triumph. The film was premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 1952, where it took the Grand Prix. Wells had pulled it off. But he had to keep moving on. As he remarked, the cherry pickers go where the cherries are.
Wells was very fond of this particular corner of the West End of London with its statue of Henry Irving, the greatest actor manager of the 19th century, looking out across to the Garrick Theatre named after the greatest 18th century actor manager. He was very fond of British audiences. He thought that they understood acting and respected it. After all, there are more theatres in this city than any other in the world. But it was not in England that he learned his stagecraft. After his father's death, the young Orson Welles had embarked on a painting trip to Ireland in 1931. Aged just 16, he took his first professional steps on stage, playing a whopping great leading part at the Gate Theatre in Dublin. To get his foot in the door, he'd concocted a typically Wellesian fantasy. I heard myself introducing myself to them as a noted actor from the Broadway stage. Now, what had possessed me? I don't know why I told that whopper. The idea of earning my living as an actor was so preposterous that it seemed to me probably that the a preposterous story was the only possible way of proposing it. It was the Gate Theatre's artistic directors, actor-designer Michael McClearmore and director Hilton Edwards, who had indulged the young pretender. Deeply au courant with the latest developments in European theatre, they introduced Wells to the shadowy stylizations of German expressionism and to the exuberance of the theatre theatrical, which jettisoned realism for heightened theatricality, ideas which informed all of Wells' subsequent work in theatre and in film. He never failed to play tribute to them by working with them whenever he could. In Othello, he had cast Edwards as Brabantio and Michael McClearmore as Iago. Wells was always eclectic. When he staged his version of Herman Melville's Moby Dick at the Duke of York's Theatre, London, in 1955, he used the simplest means to create an overwhelming effect. In Moby Dick, rehearsed, as he called it, Wells pushed the limits of what the theatre can do, the theatre theatrical. He had an astonishing cast, Patrick McGoon, Kenneth Williams, Gordon Jackson, Joan Plowright as Pip the Cabin Boy, and guess what? Orson Welles as Captain Ahab. Yeah, uh, 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 what about me? <laughs> and Mr. Peter Salis, that oh. fine actor. Let's go and join him for a cup of coffee. What was the physical impact of Welles, the man? What I must say, of course, is I fell in love with the guy immediately. You know, I mean, it was just something about his personality and the way he just handled you in the nicest possible way, you know, that, that I, I just found so attractive, if you like. In Moby Dick Rehearsed, a company of actors touring King Lear attempt to run their version of Moby Dick in an empty theatre. No set, no props, and only what lights are already there. The very theatre was used as a prop. Even the back walls were visible. With these bare means, he evoked an ocean, a ship, a tempest, a whale. It was a play within a play, and I played the sort of like the stage manager who uh, marshals the actors as they come onto the set. You go over there and you do that and that, that sort of thing. I, it wasn't a, a big part, but it was an important part in the sense that if I got it wrong, they all finish up in the wrong place. No, the extraordinary production indeed, because well, there was no set, everything was left to go on to the imagination, and the whole thing was on a boat, you know, it was all on this... Um, the ship, and we all had to rock, you see. We all had to actually, the, the entire cast was to rock, as though they were on the boat, you see. Wells was in majestic command, none more so than when Ahab, having nailed a coin to his mast, rallies his crew. Whoever of ye raises me, a white-headed whale, white, mind ye, with a wrinkled brow and a great crooked jaw, whoever raises me, that whale with three holes punctured in his starboard fluke, whoever of ye raises me, that same white whale, he gets this big gold ounce, my boys. Moby Dick rehearsed is Orson Welles' love letter to the theatre, celebrating the power of illusion, the magic of language, and the good old days when actors were really actors. It opened here at the Duke of York's Theatre in June of 1955. It was universally acclaimed as the work of a supreme master, and it ran for three weeks with only modest success. These few production stills are all that remain of it.
And that's exactly how it should be. After all, as well said himself, the theatre is written in sand. What's extraordinary is that the creative peak of Moby Dick rehearsed had come on the rebound from the bruising failure of his second major European production, Mr. Arkadin. Lumbered with a wooden leading man, Robert Arden, and an actor-director, Wells himself, who couldn't settle on a definitive version of the film, let alone a definitive version of his makeup, Mr. Arkadin is an unusual example of Wells doubting himself. Tell us about Mr. Yeah. Arcadian, which is still being made or just being made. Well, finished, it's finished, it? you know. That's it's finished. in that dangerous condition where in the morning I think it's splendid, in the evening I wonder. It's a story about a, uh, a high financier, a man of many countries and three passports. I'll bet you a couple of hundred dollars. I can trap you, Baroness. It's another of Wells's portraits of a man of power who is hollow at the core with perhaps a wry private joke about the desperately cash-strapped director playing a man of fabled wealth. Gregory Arkadin claims that amnesia has robbed him of his memories of a period earlier in his life. He hires a drifter to investigate his own past and everyone he knew there. I want you to make an investigation and prepare me a report. Report? A report on what? Gregory Arkadin. All about Gregory Arkadin. I'm serious. It's me I want you to investigate. Well, what is it you're so afraid they're going to find out? Van Thurden, on my mother's grave, I swear to you, I wish I knew. The film seems almost to be a parody of Citizen Kane. Arkadin is engaged in erasing his own history, wiping out all his old associates. What is a man, Wells asks. Where does he come from? Is he born the way he is, or is he made by events? Filming was deeply unhappy. There were stories that Wells was often late and even drunk on set. Eventually, the film's producer, Louis D'Olivet, an old friend and political mentor, took it away from him and re-edited it. Different versions appeared all over Europe, none of them officially sanctioned by Wells. The film currently exists in four different versions and two titles. But there were compensations. The actress Paola Mori, playing the role of his daughter, would soon become the third Mrs. Wells. He'd been divorced from his first two wives, Virginia Nicholson and Rita Hayworth, before coming to Europe. Mori, who was in private life, the Contessa Paola di Girfalco, was devoted to him. They were a team, as one friend put it. It was a kind of division of labor. He made the mess, and she cleared it up. Wells had come back to Europe to make Mr. Arkadin after a brief return trip to America where he had played King Lear on the television with great success. But he still had many irons in the European fire. Orson Welles's ballet, The Lady in the Ice, certainly counts as the most unexpected item on his CV. He staged it, he designed it, he devised it at the huge Stoll Theatre in London. Its very existence owes a great deal to his well-publicised, amorous fascination with ballerinas. Welles had been challenged to create a ballet by the famous choreographer Roland Petit of the Ballet de Paris. There and then, he invented a scenario, which began with a young woman frozen in a block of ice who was thawed out by a young man's fervent dancing. On the first night, he received a standing ovation. Wells grabbed every opportunity to work with both hands. One of the most fruitful and longest lasting relationships, lasting over three decades, being with the BBC. Wells started work for the corporation in 1951 in a highly successful radio series which brought back an old friend from the dead. That 
That was the shot that killed Harry Lyme. He died in a sewer beneath Vienna. As those of you know who saw the movie The Third Man. Yes, that was the end of Harry Lyme. But it was not the beginning. Harry Lyme had many lives. And I can recount all of them. How do I know? Very simple. Because my name is Harry Lyme. Among Wells' appearances for the BBC was a deeply felt reading on radio of one of his favourite texts, Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. It is hard not to feel that the elusive and multifaceted Wells was investing the poem's most famous lines with profound self-recognition. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then. I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes of multitudes. Harnessing the prodigious talent on its doorstep, the BBC soon worked with Wells in a medium to which he'd become an inventive convert. Hello, everyone, and a good evening to you. We're sorry to interrupt the programme, but we shan't detain you for very long. Tonight, we shall be looking at the television career of Mr Orson Wells. In 1955, legendary BBC producer Hugh Weldon offered him his own television series, The Orson Wells Sketchbook. These live, unscripted addresses to the camera made a considerable impact on British audiences as they watched their sets on Sunday evenings. Now, for your entertainment, here is one of them. You may have wondered why I look so peculiar on the television, and it's uh, partly, I must confess to you, the fact that you see my nose as it is. In most of the films that I appear in, I put on a false nose usually as large as I can find. In 1955, television was barely beginning to explore its potential. Wells was intrigued by it, seeing it as essentially an educational medium, a forum for conveying and discussing ideas. Invited to mark the beginning of independent television in Britain, he produced a series of documentaries of a rather radical nature. He called the series Around the World with Orson Wells, and he pushed the medium's possibilities as far as he could. <laughs> The six programmes were shot in England, France and Spain and were a big hit for the fledgling ITV. Now we're complete. No self-respecting aficionado would be seen on a Sunday without a carnation in his lapel. Their success was by no means hindered by the huge furore in the press over the programme on bullfighting. There's an infectious sense of excitement and exploration in these programmes. His fascination with his fellow human beings is everywhere in evidence, as well as his passion to communicate and his pleasure in the new medium. They have the feel of home movies made by a genius. Here we are in the uh, Wurtenbacher's garden, and this is uh, Chris Wurtenbacher, and here's his mother, Lael, who, uh, under the name of Lael Tucker, wrote uh, Lament for Four Virgins, that great bestseller. What are you laughing about? That's your mother's book. They're rather more than just charming home movies. They show Wells pioneering what he called the essay film, inventing many of its staples, like placing himself in the frame as interviewer. You got married. I did. You did? To a girl here? Yes. His Basque programs best capture his fascination with other cultures and people. Perhaps his youthful trips to Europe with his father planted the seeds for this curiosity. A basket tied to the hand and also a glove. A couple of players have a leather glove, as you'll notice. What's the glove for, Chris? Well, they act as human nets. The, the glove ones? Yes. Mm. And what about, uh, what about that uh, funny thing in the middle there that the server uses? Well, that's called a buta ahi. What? That's called a buta ahi. Well, I'm glad you told me. <laughs> and, uh, the anyway, what do you do? You bounce, bounce the ball off, off that. that. And they send it to the wall. Yeah. How's it scored? Like tennis. And what we're listening to, that wonderful sound, that continuous singing, is the, uh, is the scorekeeper. He sings the score. I never heard that in a tennis game. 
Television played to his strengths as a great raconteur and his ability to improvise on the spot. He liked to work quickly. Television suited him here too. He hoped Around the World with Orson Welles would be shown in America to prove that he was still creatively alive and well. But there were no takers. Another of the many sides of Orson Welles was the eternal actor manager. He never stopped dreaming of re-establishing his own theater company in New York. He opened in 1956 in King Lear. It was a disaster. Intended to be the opening play of a season, it marked the end of his American theatrical career. Quite out of the blue, the following year, at the urging of Charlton Heston, Wells, who was already cast in the film Touch of Evil, was invited to direct it as well. He was, at last, directing again for a major Hollywood studio. Uh, wasting our time around the shoot here. was swift and efficient, but while he was editing the film, Wells unaccountably skipped over the border to Mexico to film some material for another project altogether. When he got back, he found that he had lost control of the film. Again. Come on, read my future for me. You haven't got any. Hmm? What do you mean? Your future is all used up. His long-hoped-for American comeback never happened. It would be another 20 years before the greatness of Touch of Evil was appreciated. Back to Europe he went. Once there, he resumed filming at his own expense Don Quixote, the film for which he had abandoned, Touch of Evil, was now becoming an abiding grand obsession. Indeed, the film is about obsession, with its roots firmly in the country, which had always beguiled Wells. Wells' love affair with Spain was long and deep. He had first visited it as a teenager in 1933. And as a precocious teenager, he managed to get himself here, where he even engaged in a little bullfighting, he said, what he called his youthful taurine caper. But he remained a lifelong devotee of the bullfight, an aficionado, befriending one of Spain's greatest matadors. This gentleman is Antonio Ordóñez, Ronda's favorite son and one of Orson Welles' very greatest friends. He followed him all over Europe to watch him fight. It's not surprising that the tragic ritual of the corrida should have meant so much to Welles. Every single one of his films in some measure deals with death or a sense of fate. Spain and its colorful customs redolent of another age captivated Wells with his deep nostalgia for vanished worlds. In his documentaries, including the fascinating In the Land of Don Quixote, he paid homage to the country and its people, but his imaginative focus was always on Spain's most famous literary creation. Wells was intrigued by Don Quixote and his sidekick Sancho Panza, Cervantes' odd couple, the great myth and the great personality, as Wells dubbed them. Sancho, do you see that cloud of dust? It's a huge army. Out of time and out of place, they madly but nobly set about righting imaginary wrongs on behalf of an imaginary maiden, Dulcinea, and tilting at imaginary villains. Can't you see that they're only lambs? Stand back! Hey, Don Quixote was very dear to Wells' heart, the sort of man like Falstaff for whom the modern world has no place. Wells himself felt that he was born out of time. His contemporaries felt that about him too. He thrusts his Don Quixote into present day Spain. He and his faithful Sancho Panza are increasingly bewildered by the horrors of the modern world. My Lord, oh, a machine from hell. The monster has kidnapped the princess. But I shall free her, Sancho. Wait, sir, don't let the devil deceive you. It's only a Vespa. Stop, you scoundrel. Oh. Oh. Ah. Ah. My lady, I will free you from this evil machine. Release the lady you kidnapped immediately. Oh, Who is this lunatic? Don Quixote de la Mancha. Knight hey. Hey, hey. Tellingly, Wells even puts himself, playing the director of a film about Don Quixote, into the main film. His approach is playful, poking fun at his own craft. 
Sancho, did you free me from a dungeon just so you could hand me over later on to Satan in the form of these demonic oh, instruments? Ah, oh, Master, he's just recording our adventures. He's something like a magician. Wells couldn't bear to leave his two heroes behind. He never completed the film. His great obsession was Don Quixote, which he worked on for 30 years, carrying the cans of film around with him to the end of his life. Like Don Quixote, he had his windmills to tilt at. Don't we all, eh? Bullfighting was many things to Wells. It was a tragic ritual, a dance of death, but also a test of massacre. <laughs> it's Miles Davis, sketches of Spain. Miles Davis always said that he modeled his unique trumpet tone on Wells's sustained, rich, resonant, wonderful voice. In fact, uh, as I recollect, Miles Davis declared that Wells was a mother lover. Words to that effect. Wells embarked on more theatrical experiments back in Britain, but things went far from smoothly. In Belfast, his play Chimes at Midnight was poorly received. When it went to Ireland, the reviews were so bad, Wells cancelled the play and did his one-man show instead. In London, he was reunited with Laurence Olivier for Eugène Ionesco's play Rhinoceros, but the competitive Olivier, nervously eyeing Wells's experimental tendencies, banished him from rehearsals. The play was highly successful at the box office, but Wells's banishment from the rehearsal room remained possibly the biggest humiliation of his career. It was the last production he directed for the theater. Wells, deeply bruised by his experience with Olivier, had reason to pause. In 1961, he was 46 years old and still a major personality on the scene with an inarguable record of innovation and exciting work. And yet somehow everything seemed to turn to ashes in his hands. Thanks to the financial and logistical nightmares he'd encountered here in Europe, his name was now a byword for fecklessness and squandered talent. And then, as they are wont to do, things change. Some producers for whom he played a very small part in a very large and very bad film asked him to direct, out of a possible 87 projects, any book he liked. The book he chose was Franz Kafka's The Trial. You should have been here one hour and five minutes ago. You are a house painter? No. <laughs> the question from the examining magistrate about my being a house painter seems typical of this so-called trial that's being foisted upon me. Why, the very notebook of the examining magistrate confirms what I say. These are the examining magistrate's records. A good film, I think, should not be an illustrated, all-talking, uh, all moving version of, uh, of a printed work, but should be its, itself, a thing of itself. In Kafka's original novel, Joseph K. is arrested for some unnamed abstract crime. Wells's major change, very significantly, is to make K. guilty. Quite honestly, I can't remember a single offense that could be charged against me. But the real question is, who accuses me? Kay never does find out what the charge is. Here, though you would scarcely believe it, inside the portals of what is now the Musée d'Orsay, 
he shot some of the bleakest and most nightmarish sequences of the trial. Not that he planned it that way. When production funds ran out yet again, Wells had to think quickly when he found that none of his sets had been made. I was living in a hotel on Tuileries, pacing up and down in my bedroom, looking out the window. And I'm not such a fool as not to take the moon very seriously. And I saw the moon very large, what we in America call a harvest moon, enormous. And then miraculously, two of them. Two moons? Two moons, you know, like two suns or something, sort of sign from heaven. And on each moon there were numbers, and I realized they were the clock faces of the guard d'Orsay. And I remember that the guard d'Orsay was empty. And at 5.30 in the morning I went downstairs, got in a cab, crossed the Seine, and entered this empty railway station where I discovered the world of Kafka. Joseph K. Joseph K. Wells presents us with a uniquely bold cinematic vision. It showed that given a chance, he could make movies on schedule and on budget. It was, he said, the happiest filmmaking experience of his life. He was full of optimism. There is a new moment in filmmaking. It's not that we're better, the filmmakers, but that the distribution system has broken down a little and the public is more open, more ready for difficult subjects. Imagine what it means for me to have had the chance to make it. Indeed, to have had the chance to work. It's the first job I've got as a director in four years. In staying uncompromisingly true to his vision, Wells left both audience and critics behind him. The film was yet another box office failure. Like Joseph K., Wells' crime, if that's what it was, seemed uncertain, though his guilt was palpable. He retreated back to his villa in Franco's Spain and dwelt profoundly on the great central relationships of his life. The result was his most personal film and the one he later called his favourite out of all his movies. Yes, me, Wells with Jean Moreau as Doll Tearsheet. Is it not strange that desire should so many years outlive performance? Thou dost give me flattering voices. I kiss thee with the most constant heart. I am old. Wells as Shakespeare's fat knight, Sir John Falstaff. The core of the film is the triangular relationship between King Henry, his son Prince Hal, and Hal's surrogate father, Falstaff. It is a choice in effect between two fathers. King John Gielgud demands that Hal takes his responsibilities seriously. In the meantime, the roguish Falstaff continues to encourage Hal in more rowdy pleasures. Would your grace take me with you? Who means your grace? That villainous, abominable misleader of youth! That old, white-bearded Satan. My lord, the man I know. I know thou dost. Hal was played by Keith say, Baxter, who had already appeared in Wells' earlier doomed stage production of Chimes. Falstaff's a unique and a terribly important role for Wells, isn't it? The character of Falstaff so nearly mirrors the character of Orson Welles himself. I mean, once he collapses in a little hotel, the next day, he came to the film and he said, yes, I had a little sort of attack, Keith, so I, I'm only allowed to eat boiled chicken. And uh, we were in the Basque, where there's wonderful food. said, you can all have wonderful angoules, but I've only got boiled chicken. And he ate boiled chicken, five of them. <laughs> so this, the gargantuan appetites of uh, Wells yes. were mirrored, of course, in false stuff and the dream, but also the ducking and diving. You know, he said, the, terrible thing in my life is that I've spent 20% of my life making films, 80% trying to make films. And it broke his heart. How now, Jack? Where hast thou been? Ah, pray, God, all cowards! Go thy ways, old Jack. Die when thou wilt. If manhood, good manhood, be not forgot upon the face of the earth, then I'm a shot in herring. There lives not three good men unhanged in England. One of them is fat and grows old. God help the wild. Oh, now, Woolsack. 
Falstaff is one of Wells's greatest roles, and perhaps the most personal of all. Falstaff is full of life, yet somehow, like Wells himself, out of step with his times. Falstaff, Wells believed, belongs to a vanished Merry England, not the Machiavellian times in which he finds himself. The stunning battle scene seems to usher in a more cruel world. It's a GI's battle. My idea was the, the antithesis of the chivalric battle. The idea of it is to show the poor foot soldiers' viewpoint of a battle which is being run by people in armor and plumes. It's kind of Falstaff's ragged army viewpoint. I suppose that regret for a dying or lost world does interest me. It must because uh, it's true of uh, it's true of uh, a lot that I've done in the theater too. That process of destruction has been prefigured historically in the time of the earliest motor cars and in the destruction of chivalric England by the Tudors. And and so I can't on. believe to breathe a while. Oh, Gregory, never did such deeds as I have done this day. I the Chimes at Midnight a... has a much more personal meaning for Wells than just the loss of an idealized world. When his father, Dick, refused to give up his uncontrolled drinking, Wells' headmaster and mentor, Skipper Hill, advised the boy not to see him again. And so, as a teenager, Wells abandoned his own father, who died alone in drunken squalor. The pain and guilt stayed with Wells all his life. I killed my father, he once said. Wells loved Falstaff as he loved his father. He saw Falstaff as a truly good man, at heart profoundly innocent. God save me, my sweet boy! Have you your wits? Know you what it is you say? My king! My Joe! I speak to thee, my heart. I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. The renunciation scene in the film is incredibly charged with emotion and significance. It is overwhelming. And the look in his eyes, as he's looking up at me, in which he's sort of saying, that's my boy, although it's breaking my heart. He's fulfilled his destiny, which he had to do, but it's heartbreaking. Till then, I banish thee on pain of death, as I have done the rest of my misleaders, not to come near our person by 10 miles. It's all the more heartbreaking as Wells hardly says a word. The pain of his childhood memories is written on his face. To Wells' great delight, Chimes at Midnight received a standing ovation at the Cannes Film Festival in 1966. In America, however, the critics tore it apart. Wells was deeply hurt. Nonetheless, he was rejuvenated during this period. The reason? His blossoming relationship with a Croatian sculptress called Olga Palinkas. Deeply in love with her, Wells romantically renamed her Oya Kodar. Although still married to Paola Mori, Wells and Kodar were companions and collaborators until his death. With Kodar's support, his work rate remained prolific, even if the public rarely saw the results. The immortal story, a subtle meditation on old age and youth made for French television, was shown in art house cinemas across Europe, but not in America. The deep and the radically experimental The Other Side of the Wind, starring director John Huston, both major productions Wells hoped would give him commercial success, was sunk by financial and legal problems. Nonetheless, Wells's ability to create cinematic magic was seemingly undimmed, as was his infectious, almost childlike enthusiasm for innovation. One day, I look at the rushes, I do, he was in the, cor in the corridor, you know, and I said to him, I said, Orson, the shot you made with John Huston there, it's fantastic, because uh, uh, you managed to do something very interesting, and you know what, it's, it may, it, it's fantastic. Like a child, he became very pink in the, in, 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 in the cheeks, 
and he applauded like that. <laughs> and he said, you've seen it, you've seen it, then it works. <laughs> and that's how I felt in love with him. The collaboration of Wells and Kadar led to something quite different in his work. Oya changed him also as a filmmaker. You see this eroticism, which was never in Wells' films before. It was the first time that a lady <laughs> near him <laughs> could write for him. And I agree absolutely with you that she opened the door to the eroticism. Getting money for his films remained a struggle. Here in Paris, though, he was still revered, and here was the most likely source of financing. And so it proved. The old magician had one last trick up his sleeve, F for Fake, a brilliant semi-fictional documentary which would bring all his experiments to fulfilment, or so he hoped. Ladies and gentlemen, by way of introduction, this is a film about trickery and fraud, about lies. Tell it by the fireside or in a marketplace or in a movie. Almost any story is almost certainly some kind of lie. But not this time. No, this is a promise. During the next hour, everything you'll hear from us is really true and based on solid facts. Up to your old tricks, I see. Why not? I'm a charlatan. The film magisterially combines all Wells' impulses, the desire to instruct, to entertain, to tantalize. It's an exuberant and enchanting cinematic confidence trick. Yeah. Elmir? Elmir? Who is Elmir? The ostensible subject to the film is art faker Elmir de Hockey. But could it really be about another faker that we know? Painting, painting fakes. Among all fakers, Elmir is number two. So who could be number one? By way of an answer, Wells refers to his own past hoaxes, such as War of the Worlds. Any moment now, President Roosevelt will be receiving a delegation from Mars. From Mars, peace talks are expected. But what this film is really all about, surely, is Orson Wells and his editing suite. This is the man who couldn't stop editing Othello or Don Quixote, who sat for years at machines like these. Why? Because to shoot is human, to edit divine. Well, let's start again. Patch this film together. We'll try to patch together. Wells creates the film out of thin air. He had bought most of the footage, a lot of it from the BBC, shooting only tiny segments himself. His bravura reworking of the material is the work of a seasoned alchemist. So, that sequence where Pablo Picasso becomes infatuated with Oya, watching her from his studio, Picasso was a fast worker by which I mean to say you understand that the results of this encounter were to say the least of it extremely fruitful. A glorious fake. Most important things for him, he said, were a good pair of shoes and a good typewriter. And I must add this 16 millimeter editing table that went all over the world with us. And of course, this apparent documentary on fakers has a twist in its tail. Right, Francois. At the very beginning I, of all this, I did make you a promise. Remember? I did promise that for one hour, I'd tell you only the truth. That hour, ladies and gentlemen, is over. For the past 17 minutes, I've been lying my head off. F for Fake was a dazzling piece of prestidigitation, an outrageous cinematic conjuring trick that probably only Orson Welles could have brought off. It was his last film to be released in the cinema, so at least Europe gave him that. But alas, it knew no commercial success in America. In 1974, he returned home, occupying himself with magic shows and chat shows in the hope that perhaps someone might be inspired to ask him to direct a film in Hollywood. But Hollywood didn't call. 
What the American public wanted was Wells, the larger-than-life chat show raconteur and magician. Even the Muppets thought it wasn't quite right. How do you do, Mr. Wells? And I must say, I am shocked at you. It was different in Europe. In 1982, he received the Légion d'honneur from President François Mitterrand for his services to the art of film. Of course, the Europeans had stopped giving him money by then, too. The BBC's Arena series made a two-part documentary in which Wells discussed his career across nearly three hours of airtime. No American broadcaster would have granted him this space and the opportunity to restate his case. As ever, he was bewitching, seductive, funny, baffled. I think I, I made it uh, essentially a mistake in staying in movies because I, but it, it's the mistake I can't regret because it's like saying I shouldn't have stayed married to that woman, but I did because I love her. I would have been more successful if I hadn't been married to her, you know? I would have been more successful if I'd left movies immediately. Oh, I'm going to go on being faithful to my girl. I love her. Orson Welles spread his brilliance all over Europe as if it were his own giant canvas. Europe allowed him to innovate, to make art on his own terms. He was, of course, sometimes his own worst enemy. The opportunities the old world granted him and which he chased gradually dried up. But his European legacy is quite extraordinary. It is the work of an artist, of a magician, the great conjurer who could always produce something dazzling out of nowhere. Brilliant, original, exploratory, remarkable and sometimes profound pieces, studies of love, and death and rejection. This European work shows how complete a film artist Wells was. Orson Wells died in Los Angeles in 1985. He gave instructions for his ashes to be scattered here in Ronda, on the farm of his friend, the great bullfighter, Antonio Ordoñez gives us some idea of how important to Wells was Europe in general and Spain in particular. It adds yet another layer to this most complex, most contradictory, most multifaceted of filmmakers. Still not the whole story, of course. My quest goes on. Margaret Atwood's powerful and much-anticipated sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, Testaments, is available now on the BBC Sounds app. Next here, Neil Oliver has a twist on an old tale, the story of King Canute, updated with Vikings next. Mm -hmm.